Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming out. When I, uh, when, I, when I saw the time slot, 9 a.m. on the second day of the conference, I was a little concerned you might all be sleeping, uh, because I would be uh, if uh, I wasn't here giving the talk. But I very much appreciate that everyone has come out, and I, uh, hopefully I'll give you a, a fair trade for, uh, for that effort. What we're going to talk about today is an attack by what I think is one of the most uh, sophisticated and dangerous attacker groups in cryptocurrency today. This attack targeted uh, over a dozen cryptocurrency companies, leveraged uh, two Firefox zero days, and a sophisticated uh, suite of other efforts uh, to, to execute those attacks. We're going to spend the next 30 to 35 minutes breaking down that attack, how it happened, and highlighting a few lessons that we learned along the way in how to, and what works and what doesn't when defending against zero day attacks. I will leave five to 10 minutes at the end for questions you may have. So please, during the presentation, be thinking about questions that you may wish to ask. I'm happy to say that the end of this story is a happy ending. Uh, that we caught the attack early when it came our way, that no customer or corporate funds were ever at risk. We were able to detect, respond, and contain the attack within just a very few minutes and fully remediate within, within a day uh, uh, or so. Although, as we'll come to understand as I go through this, one of our engineers who was targeted with a phishing email, I'm not sure he has opened his email since then uh, out, of, out of fear of future phishing. By way of introduction, my name is Philip Martin. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at Coinbase. Just by show of hands very quickly, who has heard of Coinbase? A few, one, one or two, great. Coinbase is a global cryptocurrency company uh, that currently holds somewhere, uh, somewhere more than 20 billion US dollars worth of digital assets across a global user base. We also have an office here in Tokyo um, and are in the process of applying for licensure uh, here, here in Japan as a virtual currency exchange. Um, I've spent my whole career working in security uh, with a mixture of, of experience in the US government settings and in private sector settings. But you're not here to hear about me, you're here to hear about uh, the attack. We're gonna start by walking through the attack, break it down into phases, uh, and talk about each phase individually. Although in, in real life, I doubt the attacker serialized it in quite the same way. All right. We'll cover how and why we detected the attack. Um, and as, as a spoiler alert, it was not magical cyber AI that detected the attack. It was good process and procedures. Um, good playbooks, good tabletops, and good cyber hygiene uh, that resulted in this victory. Um, and finally, I will answer your questions. What we are not going to do in this talk is go through an in-depth malware analysis or teardown of the malware. There's actually a talk later today at 120 by one of the gentlemen from the line security team who will be going a little bit more into that side of things. Um, what I hope you will learn from this session and what I hope you will take away and be able to do after this session is learn a little bit how we prepared ourselves to be resistant to this kind of attack and be able to think a little bit about in your context, in your threat model, and in your companies, how you might be able to think about these same, these same techniques and, and attackers, uh, assuming that you have uh, attackers with zero days in your, in your threat model. With that, a quick summary and overview of the, uh, of the attack. So from May until June, approximately, of this year, an attacker group conducted a very sophisticated cyber operation targeting about 200 individuals. Uh, together, they represent over a dozen global cryptocurrency companies. This operation displayed a level of sophistication and resourcing that is exceptional among actors active in the cryptocurrency space today. 
It involved an extensive target selection and research. Building that list of 200 people took, took a fair bit of time. Um, it involves sophisticated social engineering, and we'll dive into what that looked like. And finally, it involved two very expensive remote Firefox zero days. We believe the attacker in this instance has been active since around 2016, um, mainly targeting cryptocurrency exchanges. We see evidence, and we'll go into this later, that this attacker has been involved in attacks on Japanese exchanges, on European exchanges, and on American exchanges. So they work across geographical boundaries. We've seen evidence that these attackers have had access to at least six zero days over those three years. Um, although these Firefox exploits, or these Firefox zero days, were the first uh, fully remote O days that we think we've seen them use. Um, so with that overview, let's dive into sort of a phase-by-phase -phase review of, of how these attackers operated. And again, I'll, I'll caveat this with, while uh, the various tasks here were certainly performed by the attackers, we don't know exactly that, that they did it in this order or, or on this precise timeline. There's a lot of inferences and assumptions we're making in this. So first phase is the reconnaissance, the recon phase. Uh, this is the phase that, quite frankly, we know the least about of all the phases because it occurred sort of entirely external to Coinbase. We know that these attackers put together a list of about 200 individuals uh, for their initial phishing delivery sort of target set. We know the attackers targeted almost exclusively personal email addresses. So while they identified individuals at targeted companies, they went to the further effort of identifying not corporate, but personal email addresses for their malware, malware delivery. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end because it does make the defender's job much, much harder um, in terms of detecting that initial delivery of, uh, of the social engineering and of the phishing. We know that they did get a few of the targets very, very wrong. They were, they were clearly targeting cryptocurrency companies. Some of the people on their target list had nothing to do with cryptocurrency companies. But the vast majority they got, they got very, very right. So this is actually a very high fidelity list that they were able to assemble. They were interested more in IT, infrastructure, security, and engineering targets than they were in other targets overall. And we'll see this when we talk about um, how they went through their target selection um, and how they chose eventually who to give, who to, who to, who to expose to the zero day. Um, what we don't know is that we, is we don't know where or how they did their research. Our assumption is this is classical open source intelligence techniques, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, what have you, um, combined with, with you know, some additional good research and follow-up to find those personal email addresses perhaps via data dumps uh, or other third-party breaches that they were able to correlate. Um, we, we don't know how long this phase took or how, how far in advance it, ha it happened. Um, it may have been something, um, and this gets back to the timeline here may be wrong. They may have developed the Firefox capability first and they were done the recon after they had the exploit or the other way around, we just don't know. Um, the next, the next phase, once they developed this list, or as I mentioned, once they had developed the exploit and developed this list, um, they went on to sort of weaponization, right? So this, this phase traditionally is where you acquire the technical capability to execute an attack. And uh, this is a very interesting phase for this attacker. And I'm lumping two separate things into the weaponization phase in this attack. One is the, uh, the exploit development, so, so finding the two Firefox zero days. But the second interesting methodology, uh, or interesting piece of this, is they, they, they acquired the ability to deliver their phishing. So we'll talk about um, the exploits, and then we'll talk about, uh, or rather, I'm going I'm to flip that around. We're going to talk about the, the, the phishing, and then we're going to talk about the exploits. One of the reasons, as we'll see in the next phase delivery, one of the reasons this, this campaign was so um, effective and so difficult to detect was because the attackers went to the trouble of acquiring legitimate 
uh, university email addresses in order to send their phishing. They actually sent that phishing from two different Cambridge University email accounts, um, legitimate Cambridge University email accounts. They hosted much of their infrastructure on Cambridge University systems. Um, so in terms of using IP reputation lists or email filtering tools that might filter out lower reputation or, or uh, or lower lifetime emails, uh, none of that would have been effective against this threat because it was a legitimate Cambridge domain, it was legitimate Cambridge emails, and it was uh, talking about legitimate Cambridge um, topics, as we will see. So in this phase, they acquired that access. Now, we don't know if they bought it or if they got it or if they stole it somehow or if this is just a case of account takeover of the Cambridge systems. Um, but at the end of the day, they acquired a very, very hard to detect uh, set of tools for delivering and hosting that, that phishing infrastructure. The second thing they did in this phase is they developed their zero days. So I'm not going to go a full in-depth teardown of the two zero days, but I will mention a few interesting facts about them. There were two zero days. So one was an exploit, CVE 2019 11707, that was an exploit in what's called the, the, JIT, the JIT compiler. Um, that allowed the attackers to escape the web page and get into the browser process itself. In Firefox, the browser process is separately sandboxed. So even with access to the browser process, you still can't do much on the underlying system. They leveraged a second zero day at CVE 2019 uh, 11.708. As a that was a sandbox escape to, to break out of the Firefox the sandboxed Firefox process and gain access to the underlying host. They chained these two exploits together in a very stable way. In our experience, we were able to recover the the, the, the zero day as part of our response, and we're able to test it out uh, a number of times. And it was it's a very very stable, easy to use uh, exploit. So the first exploit, the the the, the JIT escape was simultaneously-ish discovered by a, uh, a researcher at Google's Project Zero named Samuel Gross. Um, we were able to share the in the wild exploit with him um, and uh, determine sort of together that they're very, very, while the, the underlying bug is the same, the method of exploitation is very, very different between the two. So we believe the attacker independently discovered this first O'Day. Um, probably through uh, uh, searching for zero days that looked like a few historical similar zero days. Uh, the second zero day, I think, is, is more interesting to me because it is a, uh, is a brand new sandbox escape that no one had ever used or seen before. Um, and while the underlying mechanism that was exploited to escape the sandbox has actually been available in Firefox for a very, very long time, probably years. Um, the specific method that the attackers used to trigger it had only been possible since about, um, th since about the middle of May. Right? So, so what this tells me, what I'm inferring from this, is that the attacker's uh, timeline from bug discovery to weaponization uh, was somewhere around two weeks. Now, that is an extremely short weaponization timeline to go from initial bug discovery to weaponized exploit. Uh, shockingly short. That speaks of ex uh, significant experience in exploit development um, and of a sort of very focused intent on the part of these attackers. Now, I'm assuming here that the attackers discovered this exploit. It's completely possible the attackers purchased this exploit from a group that focuses much more heavily on exploit development, where a two-week development li or a two-week weaponization lifecycle might not be as shocking. Um, and again, it's 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 hard for us to say in either direction. Uh, we we can say based on the structure of the Oday code. Um, and sort of what it looked like overall. It seemed like the work of someone who was very experienced in exploit development and was reusing components sort of exploit to, to exploit. Things like ROP gadget finders, things like that, were, were, were nicely sort of compartmentalized in the code. So once they had the, uh, the Cambridge access, 
the O-Days chained together and their target list, now it's time, now things get interesting. And now is when these attackers are really, for the first time, um, intersecting with, with, with Coinbase. So delivery. This is my favorite phase because this is when the attackers start to send out their spear phishing. Now, as we mentioned, they have this initial target list of about 200, 200 email addresses, almost entirely personal email addresses, Gmail, Yahoo, that kind of thing. Um, and in this phase, they start from that 200 person list and conduct, and we'll walk through it here in a second, conduct a social engineering campaign designed to determine which of these 200 targets were worthy of that zero day. They didn't just sort of spray and pray and throw the zero day at 200 people. They wanted to make sure that when they delivered it, the people they delivered it to would be high payoff targets. Again, this speaks of a level of operational sophistication um, that is perhaps not, not uncommon, but, but certainly um, makes them stand out among, among attackers. Right. So let's see, what, what, did, what did this, what did this uh, spear phishing look like? So this is, the, this is an example of the initial contact email that the attackers sent out. There were at least two variants, one using the Adams Prize and one using the Adam Smith Prize, which we'll, we'll see that version next. These are two real prizes that Cambridge hands out. Um, one is a prize in mathematics, one is a prize in economics. Um, they also actually have external review committees for both of these prizes. These are, this is completely legitimate. If you visit that link um, in that first email, that does not go to an exploitation page. That goes to an informational page that was lifted off of uh, elsewhere from Cambridge's site. If you see, there's an interesting, there's an interesting tidbit in that, in that link. What you see in that link is it doesn't go to a, a top-level Cambridge page, right? It's not www.cambridge.ac.gov. Um, it's actually going to a, a personal workspace, right? You see that, that GH, uh, sorry, GRH37 in the middle of that URL. Um, this is the attackers hosting their social engineering and later exploitation infrastructure on a personal sites feature that Cambridge offers to staff and professors, making it much harder to, from a reputation point of view, determine that this is, 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 uh, is bad. Right. The, the, the name, if you dig into Gregory Harris, who signed the email there, uh, at the time, um, if, you, if you dug into that, that person, you would find a good backstop. You would find a LinkedIn accounts, with, reason, with, with related experience, a number of connections, you would find all the sort of the, the, the indicators that you would expect of a, of a real person, right? Very lot of work went into that phase to backstop a, an account that, that thoroughly. The same thing with uh, Neil Morris, who is the other identity the attackers used to, uh, to, send, to send phishing. Neil Morris generally sent Adams Prize emails. Gregory Harris generally sent Adam Smith Prize emails. Um, but there were exceptions on both sides. And again, we see that Adams Prize uh, page hosted on a personal page under the Cambridge domain. Um, and again, this link was not malicious in any way. Um, no exploitation, no additional features, um, nothing other than a copied page from a public Cambridge site. Now, if you responded to these emails with something like, I'm not an engineer, um, or I don't know what you're reaching out to me for, the attackers would cease, would cease contact um, pretty much immediately. If, if you did respond at, with, with some other response that made, made them think you weren't interesting, maybe, you, maybe you're a junior software engineer or something like that, the attackers would cease contact. They just wouldn't, wouldn't send you anything else. Um, if, however, you did respond and reply in a way that made you interesting to the attackers, you would get a follow-up like this a few days later. So interestingly, they didn't automate this. A human was responding to these things and doing it on a cadence that made sense, right? That felt like you were talking to another human being somewhere 
uh, that, was, that had a busy life and had other things to do. Finally, if at the end of the day, the attackers, and, and this, was, this message was only sent to about five people. Finally, if at the end of the day, the attackers thought you were worth the zero day, you'd get this email. Now this email, um, so a, this process took between 10 days and two weeks for most people to go from initial contact to, uh, of, of that 200 people in the initial list to the about five people that got sort of the final message in the, in the scheme. And here finally we get to the exploitation. So that URL um, was a legitimate copy of the login page for Cambridge's uh, identity provider, their IDP, with two small changes. The first small change was a little bit of JavaScript to make sure that the person visiting the page matched their target profile. Right, so they seem to want Firefox on Mac or or uh, or anything on any other operating system. We didn't see any indication that this campaign contains non-Mac exploitation, but this actor group has displayed Windows exploitation in the past, so it's possible it was there and we just didn't do the right thing to trigger it. The other thing they added, uh, so if, if you if you visited the site and you weren't in their target profile. You know, you were visiting from, from Firefox on Windows or whatever, you'd see this, right? Browser not supported, so please install a supported browser. Right. Interestingly, when we talked to people who got this far, um, the, the, at least one of them visited this in Chrome and saw this page. And we asked, and, and then went on to install Firefox um, just so he could be exploited by this. And we asked him at the time, why did you do that? Um, what, what, why did you think that was a good idea? And his response to this was, well, I figured it was just uh, an academic institution that was just broken. Um, and so this was, this was just normal. This was, this, his assumption was, this is a university. Universities are bad at IT, so let's just go ahead and do this. So the second change on that page was the inclusion of the exploitation code. So the, the exploit JavaScript was hosted on a separate site um, this analyticsfit.com domain. This was hosted in, on Bulletproof hosting in, the, uh, in, in Eastern Europe at the time. Um, and it's what actually uh, hosted the, the JavaScript that triggered the O-Day. Right. So assuming the exploit landed, um, the shell code that was part of this exploit would shell out, would cause Firefox to shell out to curl and pull down a stage one implant. That stage one implant uh, was a variant of the NetWire family, and its primary job seemed to be reconnaissance. So it would, it, stage one would run, it would take a, a snapshot of your local system, it would um, do some initial credential theft, it would grab SSH keys, AWS keys if they're there, uh, uh, key store information, basic things like that, exfiltrate all of that. Um, and then what we observed was a delay. Uh, after stage one. And what we believe this, this indicates is that stage one was reported back, gave an inventory of the system to a controller somewhere who then made a decision on whether to move forward to stage two or not. Uh, stage two was a variant of the Mox family. And this is a much uh, less common piece of malware than, than the NetWire family. The attackers seem to use this as a full-fledged rat or remote access trojan. Um, and we've observed the activity of stage two consistent with direct human control. So our observation of the activity once stage two showed up um, was sort of fairly unique on a per, uh, uh, per target basis. As I mentioned, I'm not gonna dive like super deep into the malware analysis here. There's a lot of articles you can find online um, that break this down further if, 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 you're, if you're interested in the, in the deep analysis. Actions on target. Um, so what, did the, what does the attacker do once, they're, once, the, once they landed on a system? Um, so we also know very little about this phase. In our case, um, when, the, when, the, when, when our employee sort of um, went through this process and got, got exploited and had his system uh, exploited, uh, we responded within, within about 20 minutes of that initial exploitation. 
Um, so we don't actually know what they would have done with a longer, with a longer window on this system. Um, we can infer things based on uh, reports from previous exploitation that, that I would encourage you all, if you're interested in this actor, to go and read. Um, that their ultimate goal here was to get in a position to steal cryptocurrency. So they would have gone into a longer internal reconnaissance phase, looked around, evaluated systems, and evaluated sort of a path towards gaining access, access to cryptocurrency. Um, I will notice, I will note one interesting thing that we saw, which is um, the attackers, as I mentioned, in, in stage one for the, uh, for the malware, seem to do a fairly basic automated credential pillage. Um, in stage two, we saw some uh, evidence that they attack that they that they went after uh, uh, browser credential stores, session tokens, stored passwords, that kind of thing. And we saw uh, we saw evidence that they were interested in pivoting from the local machine into cloud systems, which is an interesting and I think not super common TTP that the attacker lands on a system inside of, a, of, of an enterprise and chooses to go from there to the SaaS applications that that enterprise uses. Um, uh, so that's including email, file storage, things like that. Um, there's some interesting, and I'll mention the details later, some interesting Japanese language reporting on these attackers at well, but goes into much more additional depth on, on some of their previous activities. So let's talk about the attacker a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, we believe that they were active since 20, since they've, they've been active since 20, 2016. They're not covered uh, by any threat intelligence firm we're aware of. Um, most of them are treating this, this actor as some sort of like unconfirmed activity. They're not named by any other, by any threat intelligence firm that, that we know about. Um, the, there's almost no English language reporting on this group. There is some Polish language reporting and there's some Japanese language reporting um, from, the, from, the, from Japan's Cyber Emergency Center. Um, but very, very little US language reporting. Um, this is one of the things that we were trying to fix by releasing the attack details in the way we did was to create more awareness about around this attacker group and their, their TTPs, their techniques, tactics, and procedures. We believe this is the same actor that breached CoinCheck. Um, so the CoinCheck breach uh, uh, was investigated by a number of parties. The, 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 Japan, the Japan Cyber Emergency Center released a report. Um, that report is, displays significant overlap with the, with the techniques, tactics, procedures, as well as the malware families and command and control hosts that, that our attacker used in this, in this attack. So we assess they're the same actor underneath. As I mentioned, we've seen they have sent at least half a dozen zero days across the various attacks. So this is a very well-resourced actor or a very experienced zero day or with a, an attacker with a very experienced zero-day research team. It could go either direction. Um, these, the, the Firefox zero-days were the first fully remote zero-days that we've seen this attacker deploy, but I doubt they will be the last zero-days that we will see this attacker um, deploy. Additionally, we have not seen this attacker active outside cryptocurrency, or if they have been, they're using different tools and different tactics. Uh, that, that we are that that uh, we cannot link back to uh, our the attacker group in this attack in this attack. So let's talk about so our response, some of our lessons learned, and some of the things that you all might be able to take away uh, if you're worried about attackers of this of this capability. So first, the first thing that that validated one of our approaches, I will say, is that. Visibility is king when we're talking about detection and response. Right? The, the, our time to detect, as I mentioned, was, was 20 minutes. Really, our, actually, that's our time to in, sort of engage and engage. Um, the time to detect was basically instant. And that was the case because we 
internally at Coinbase are heavily focused on ensuring that we have complete coverage in our security telemetry and endpoint security tools. Um, we, are, we are fanatical about it because uh, what, you aren't, what you aren't watching, you can't defend. Right. Um, two, we're also fanatical about, about alert quality. We, we, I, I personally believe strongly in the concept of, of alert fatigue. That is, that analysts who get a lot of alerts from a system um, start to lose trust in that system and do not engage with that system when it sends you alerts. Because of that, we focus very heavily um, on the concept of the alerts that our analysts and engineers receive should be high quality, should be actionable, and should be, uh, this is a very amorphous term, but should be interesting, right? They, they shouldn't be seeing trivial things coming from an alerting pipeline. Trivial things should be dealt with by a machine or by a computer. Um, they should be seeing things that a human being needs to action or think about in some way um, so that they stay engaged with these alerts and stay responsive when they receive the alerts. This is why, while our time to, to, alert, or to alert was basically instant, our time to engage was you know, 20 minutes because our engineers trust our alerts. Now, time to engage, 20 minutes, time to recovery under a day. That's also quite short. Why? What, what led to that? What can you take away here? Well, number one, we practice. I have a, I don't know how well this is going to translate into, into Japanese, but uh, the, the standard I use for this and I encourage our teams to think about is if you can't do it drunk at 3 o'clock Christmas morning, you can't do it. All right? I have no idea if that translates well. But um, in other words, uh, practice so that the response becomes ingrained, right? Muscle memory, if you will. Um, do that through the use of playbooks. Do that through the use of tabletops. Do that through the use of red teams and internal assessments that are, that are no notice, they're surprise red teams. So that when, you're account when you encounter a real life situation, while you may not have responded to the exact parameters before, you know your tools, you know your processes, and you trust your teammates to execute on that mission. Right. Um, last, the thing I will, I will uh, re-emphasize uh, is that if you're in cryptocurrency or if you are a vendor with significant access to a cryptocurrency company, zero days are in your threat model even if you thought they weren't before. Uh, you have to plan for uh, the, the, to, to lose the initial battle when you're planning for zero days. There's a famous Mike Tyson quote that I like a lot in this case. That is, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Right? And then it's all about where do you go from there. What a zero day in your threat model means is you cannot avoid that first punch in the face. You have to accept it and be able to respond to it uh, at, at the time of the attacker's choosing. With that and five minutes left, I would, I would love to take your questions um, if there are any out there. And let me just get this earpiece in uh, for any questions in Japanese. Thank you very much.